presenting Dr. C.R. Oliver with a clip from his message, Zadok, a message concerning how we are supposed to be sons of Zadok, not sons of Eli. How many of you know that those who came to the temple that particular morning that Jesus took the scriptures did not know that this was the day of a pronouncement from heaven and the pronouncement would go forth and it would never be retracted. It would be forever and ever and it would never be taken back. God said it. Jesus said it. And those that sat in that congregation heard it for the first time didn't know what to do with it. It didn't matter whether they had any knowledge of what to do with it. It had to be said at that specific moment, at that specific time, so that it would be written in the Word of God forever and ever. And that is the way I come to you this morning. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know how I don't want to say what I'm going to say this morning. You have no idea what is going forth from this pulpit this morning. The Lord told me that he has chosen this congregation because of not only your strategic location as to the beginnings of this country, but because you have come before him and allowing yourself to be a vehicle. And, and I saw shafts of light that came forth from this congregation, from this, from this position throughout the entire nation. So that what is pronounced today is the same as if it were pronounced in every pulpit with or without permission from the Holy Ghost. Now, you're the only congregation that's going to hear that because the next service, the Lord told me to, to speak on another subject. So this subject is for you. What you do with it is immaterial to me. I'm going back to Texas. I told, I told Brother uh, Evanson and Sister Evanson, why do you trouble me here at this church? Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't you let me just stay where I'm at and, and pursue what I want to pursue and write and not have to speak? You hear voices that come through here all the time. You don't need my voice. I'm not anybody. I don't have any program. I don't have any kingdom. I don't have any reason to, to be put upon like you put upon me. And yet when I began to to look at this invitation which I did not accept I said why do you need me back there I spoke what the Holy Spirit told me to speak regardless of what was there I spoke on holiness and righteousness I spoke on the, the beauty of the song of Solomon I left it was enough and then the Holy Ghost blessed Holy Spirit began to move in my heart and I said Lord not again he said yes again because what this congregation doesn't understand is that they are the place that I'm going to deposit just like Jesus deposited in that temple understanding of the will and the power of God and what they do with it will be the same as those in the temple they'll have to make some decisions it is my will says the Lord to deal with individuals I never wanted to deal with corporate bodies it was never my intention to look out over crowds and millions and, and bless them as a corporate being. My, my whole soul was to, to Adam. And I wanted to embrace him on a daily basis, but some devil came along and sought to take that away from me. But I'm reestablishing it. Every generation I'm reestablishing that in the individuals. And the biggest problem the world has is with a corporate body.
It's always been that way. And I will show you this morning what the Holy Spirit revealed to me. And you will understand that I'm here to announce the end of the church age. And the day of the Gentile is through. And the march of God is moving to a new thing and it doesn't involve anything we've ever seen before. It involves a return to those reserves, to those, those individuals scattered across the globe who God knows by name. And it is that remnant, that is that body, that group, those individuals known to Him and sometimes known to one another, that He will bring forth His glory and manifest the sons of God. From Adam he began to deal with Noah and then from Noah he began to deal with Abraham and a lot and from, from them he began to deal with individuals until the rise of prophets and Samuels and judges and others and, and then he came to the corporate body himself and he spoke something into being and he said, I'm telling you there are ends in history. There are days of finish. There are days in which after this things are different. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you this morning how he's dealt with corporate bodies over, over the years so that you understand what's happening and what's going to happen to the church. This is not an impossible task, so turn with me, if you will, and stand with me, if you will, for the reading of God's Word in Ezekiel 44. Good old Ezekiel. He's the very basis this, this chapter is the very basis for the writing of the sons of Zadok. But it's important that we understand the dichotomy that's here. Are you ready? Beginning with verse 5. And the Lord said unto me. And we can read it together if you like. Why don't we just do that? A creflo dollar does that all the time. Why can't we? And the Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all of its laws. Mark well who may enter the house and all who go out from the sanctuary. Now say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, Thus said the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of all your abominations. When you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart, uncircumcised in flesh, I know we don't all have all the same translation, to be in my sanctuary to defile it, my house, and when you offered my, my food and fat and the blood, and they broke my covenant because of all your abominations, and you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. Thus said the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel and the Levites who went far from me. Get this verse. When Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers of the house, as ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice of the people, and they shall stand before the people to minister to them. Now I want you to get this picture real quick. There are two kinds of ministry. And once you understand that there are two kinds of ministry, it's going to change the way you look at the corporate body from now on. There is that group, those group of leaders, ministers, Levites, who God has released, said, oh, go ahead and minister to them. The congregation worshipped idols. They didn't say anything. They worshipped idols. The congregation didn't say anything. It was like a standoff. Everybody didn't say anything. And they can minister to the people. Because see there's a multitude of people who want to be ministered to today. But then God made a dividing line. He cut it right down the middle. 
And he made it where we could understand it. Are you ready? Let's enter now that verse. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore I have lifted my hand in an oath against them, saith the Lord. They shall bear their iniquity. Bow. No sacrifice. No way to get out of it. It's coming home to roost. It's there. And that's the way that is. On whatever day Ezekiel spoke that. And it was forever. And it couldn't be changed. And it was that congregation that heard that message that you're reading about today. Wow. Look at verse 13. And they shall not come near me. He said, I'm going to make a division. That bunch of preachers, that bunch of church leaders, that congregation cannot come near me to minister to me as a priest. Nor come near any of my holy things. Nor enter the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. It's locked in. It's sealed. I'm going to write a book. I'm writing one right now, but right after it, I'm going to write another book entitled, It's Sealed. There's some things that are just sealed up, folks. There's not any way you can deal. You're not going to be able to unlock the seal and go back and say, well, I wish I could change that. Are you ready? Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all of its work. If you want to do church work, if you want to be religious, fine. And for all that has to be done to in it, all the things that you just carry out, call religious worship. But, how many know that in verse 15, that but is not just a connector between two thoughts? <laughs> how do you know that that word but means that everything before that is now canceled by what's coming after that? That's what but means. If you say, I love you, but... If you say, you all come, but, you know that what follows after that but is more important than what went on in front of it. Listen to what comes after this but. But the priest, the Levites, the sons of righteousness, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, said the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall keep my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. How do you know? Don't you know that that's a little group based on a great big group? God has his people. And it shall be when they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. And he goes on to talk about the differences. And they shall take off their garments that, are, that they wear in the holy places and not mingle it with the streets. Verse 19. And in their holy garments they shall not sanctify the people by touching them with it. Verse 23. And they shall teach my people the what? Between what? The holy and the unholy. What's the most important thing to be taught? Huh? All right. Thank you. And they shall cause them. What does cause them mean? Grab them by the collar and shake their teeth until they understand. Get this message. Discern. You discern. You discern. You discern. Between the unclean and the clean. You quit living the kind of life you live. You know, a holy man can do that, but not many people are holy enough to try it. In controversy, they shall stand as judges, this, these sons of Zadok. And judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes and all my appointed meetings. My appointed meetings. My appointed meetings. Only ones I'm meeting with are the sons of Zadok. And they shall hallow my Sabbath. 
and they shall not defile themselves. And then it goes on and on and on. Thank you. You may be seated. You're a nice congregation. A woman came down the aisle this morning, laid her hands on my head, and she said, Obedience. And that's what it's all about this morning. That's what you're hearing about. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I have some things I've got to show you in order for me to be obedient. And I just have to say, Lord, teach me, help me to know how to unlock this Pandora's box, so to speak. How to, how to show the congregation exactly what you want done. Because, see, it's necessary that the Holy Spirit, and now you who are group people that were here last night, I told you were part of the group, let me tell you, I need your prayers at this point because we're entering into a point here that is so powerful and it is so static. There's so much, there's so much gravity to what's about to be said. It'll go forth from this pulpit into other pulpits until it saturates the world. This is it! Ezekiel, when he spoke these words, don't you know that the 44th chapter is after the 13th and 14th and 15th and 16th? It's the culmination of the things that were building on the inside of Ezekiel. And he was, as he was dealing with the people of God during that day, he was having to, to deal out of the resources of his heart and God was putting on the inside of him something he, he knew was bigger than he was. And he had to watch it and look at it and, and see it grow on the inside. So if you'll hurry with me, let's go just flipping back. Can we flip back a few pages and find out some of the things? In chapter 33, real quick, 31 through 33. So they, so they come to you as a people do and they sit before you as my people. And they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. He, God was showing them the inside of the corporate body. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song, Ezekiel. When you preach, they love it. Of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, but they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, and surely it will come, then they shall know that a prophet has been among them. It won't be the same kind of voice as they've been hearing all along. They will say, wow, we should have listened. Drop back now to chapter 21. Just going back, see, getting the background. Before chapter 44, you've got to have a chapter 21, right? <laughs> Verses 6 and 7. When he began to see this, when he began to re God began to reveal what was happening, see, Ezekiel saw in great panoramic view some of the things that are still coming to pass right now. We're on the threshold of some of the things he was talking about. God revealed him great panoramic moves of what the Spirit was doing among the corporate body. And he said to them, Sigh therefore, son of man. Go, oh, oh, before the Lord, I don't want to say what I know has got to be said. And with a breaking heart, and with a sigh, with bitterness before their eyes. And when they shall say to you, why are you sighing? You shall answer, because of the news from God. Boy, I tell you what, if, if, if it were real this morning in the pulpits of America, there'd be such sighing and weeping because of the news that's coming from God. Jump back to Ezekiel 8 with me real quick. You're Bible people. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching so you can see. So you have eyes to hear and see and ears to hear and, and, and you can understand. Chapter 8 verse 7. So he brought me to the door of the court. He showed me what was going on at the church house in the corporate meetings. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And then he said to me, Son of man, dig in the wall. And so what did he do? He brought in the wrecking crew. No, he did exactly what God told him to do. And tonight I'm going to be preaching on doing what exactly what God tells you to do and the results of it. So be back. 
and the son of man dig into the wall and when I dug into the wall there was a door and he said go in that door and see the wicked abominations which they're doing so he went below the surface of the tabernacle he went below the surface of the great temple he went below down where the apartments were, where the, where the priests were living, where the preachers were living, and where the administrators were living, and where the leaders of the church were leading and living. And I went and I saw. Go in and see the wicked abominations which they're doing there. So I went in and I saw. And there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed on all the walls, over all the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel, the church leaders. And in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, the priest. And each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen that the elders of the Israel, what they do in the dark? Boy, the corporate structure can sure shield a lot of things, can't it? Because see, an individual can come and just be outside the will of God and look good at the corporate. Yeah, when the church shows up, everybody looks the same, doesn't it? And every man in the room has his own idols. Uh-oh, God said that's an individual. This is an individual thing. Mm. For they say the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord has forsaken this land. There are a lot of folks saying that now, had not they? And he said, turn again. You'll see greater abomination than there, what they're doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the house. And there he saw the women, the wives. They were sitting weeping at the God of fertility, the Babylonian fertility God. And he said, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, I'll show you some greater ones. Verse 16, and he went with me in the inner court of the house, of the, in the inner court of the house of the temple. Now we're getting closer. <laughs> and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were 75 men with their backs turned from the temple and toward the sun, worshiping to the east. And so Ezekiel came to chapter 44 and he says, God, I've seen enough. Kill them. Kill them and kill all the people with them and let's start over again. And God said, no. What good would that do? Death's going to overcome all of them anyway. But there's going to be one thing that I'm going to redeem out of that. The sons of Zadok. And they're going to be a living witness. As small the number they are, those sons of righteousness are going to show the people where they messed up, screwed up, botched up, and were outside of my will and died in their iniquities. Now that's the way God has dealt with people before. Turn with me, if you will, very quickly. I, should I look at this? What time is the next service? Huh? What's the next service? <laughs> yeah, he speaks the <laughs> magic words. <laughs> I love it. And, and turn with me in Psalm 78. I'm going to tell you there's something on the inside that's got to come out. But if you don't draw it out, it's not going to come out. I'm talking about you need to get hold of the horn to the altar this morning and say, Lord, reveal this to me. Let this thing be real to me as it is to him. Let, let this thing work on the inside of me like it's working on the inside of him. Dear God, call this forth in my life. I tell you, you can't be passive anymore. You're not going to be passive in front of this. Once this thing is said, brother, it's out of the box. Oh, glory to God. In Psalm 78, listen with me. Look at verse 60. Look at verse 60. I want to tell you what God did with Moses when he established the tabernacle of the congregation stopped at verse 60, Psalm 78, and David knew it. There was an end to the tabernacle. There was an end to picking up the tent. There was an end to the cloud by day and, and the fire by night. There was an end because God was not there anymore. Let me tell you, Samuel was born into a profligate situation. He was born and, and was given to God and Samuel went and lived in the house of Eli. 
And Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And Hophni and Phinehas lived like dirt. They laid with the women. They drank. They took more than their offering. They lived off of everybody. They were the pitiful example of an Eli system that would not correct and would not say and would not speak against such abomination. And Samuel grew up in that mess. But Samuel was unfazed by it because he listened to a voice they never heard. They listened to a voice that they never could comprehend. He had a voice talking to him from heaven. And he said to him, I recognize who's talking to you, but I don't hear that voice anymore. I want you to know there, come, there came a time that in the tabernacle, the voice was not heard anymore. Look at verse 60. So that God forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. When the battle came and the Philistines came, bam! They took the Ark of the Covenant in and lost it. End of that corporate. Never hear of another tabernacle. David raised up a small tabernacle for himself and God said, I'm going to be in that tabernacle. Because that's an individual praying before me, before the Lord, coming to me as a king and a priest, and he's standing before me as an individual. That's the one I'm going to be blessing at the end of the days. Those, when they raise up their own tabernacle, when you raise up the tabernacle of John, and the tabernacle of Sam, and the tabernacle of Tom, and the, and the tabernacle of Paul, and the tabernacle of whoever you are, when you raise that tabernacle, God said, I'll be with you. I'll sure be there. I'll be there, but I'm not going to be with that corporate mess anymore. I'm going to tell you this corporate mess is over. There had to come a time when God said enough is enough and Shiloh was enough. They saw the very holy things that they thought were absolutely their hallmark wandering off over the west, going home to another land, to a people that didn't even understand it, desecrated. And they lost it at Shiloh. Yeah, they wept. Some of them said this is the end of the day. Eli fell off of his, off of his place of perch and, and died. And Hophni and Phinehas had a son born by the name of Ichabod. And the whole thing fell. When will the end be for the age of the Gentiles and church as usual? Today. Today, bless God. Today. Let it be understood across this nation that today God has said enough is enough. I'm bearing forth a new hour. I will be God and I will draw my people to myself. After Shiloh, there was the temple. The tabernacle had the glory of God in it, but then the glory departed. And the people kept on worshiping, and they acted just like there was glory there when there wasn't any. And God said, I stopped at Shiloh. I'm not bless that anymore. I'm not going to have anything more to do with it. Then came along Solomon. And Solomon built a great temple to the Lord and it was honest and it was right where God wanted to be and, and the Lord said, all right, I'll, I'll bless that. It's coming out of me, I'll bless it. So he brought the temple forth to replace the tabernacle. And the glory of God came and a lady read a passage out of Second Chronicles 5 and then on to chapter 7 if you want to see it. And let me tell you folks, let me tell you, when is this next service? Starting right now. Let the doors open. Let the, let the folks come in. Tell you what, those those of you that choose to go to your class and, and the teacher, if you want, go ahead. Peter, are you here with the video series? Peter Prince is here. Just stand there and tell my group that we're just going to be here. And those of you that need to go, you go. It's okay. You go. And if you're a teacher, you need to go, especially if you're taking care of children. I can't stop this message, this man. We need to hear God's word. He's only here with us today. So, go for it. Solomon came before the Lord. 
And he prayed and the prayer was an honest prayer before him with clean hands and a pure heart and the sons of Zadok were there. And the priests of Zadok are the ones that when they, when they stood before the Lord, the temple was filled with the smoke. And they were there because God said, you're the chosen one. I chose you back there with Ezekiel. You know, under Ezekiel you were chosen. And, and I'm, letting, I'm letting you be manifest in these days. And it was the sons of Zadok that stood there. And the glory of the Lord came and filled the temple. And the people rejoiced. And there was a day of fire, wasn't there? Fire came down. It's like the fire of the tabernacle. There came the fire of the temple. And the holy presence of God was there. And they knew God was there. Oh, they bowed before Him. Oh, they sang before Him. They said, The mercy of the Lord endureth forever. And then, along came Ezekiel. Out there in captivity, this, the temple was burned and half destroyed. And the Babylonians came and wiped all the glory of Solomon away. And there they stood by the river Kibar. And the Lord said, you want to know why I allowed that to happen to the holy place at Jerusalem? Ezekiel said, I don't really want to know, Lord, but if you want to tell me, I'll take it. And he said, take it and write it. So the whole world will know what, how I deal with corporate bodies. I want individuals. I want you to know this morning that when Nehemiah and Ezra came and they began to, to rebuild that temple and, and the years had passed of captivity and now they were able to rebuild the temple, the presence of the Lord never came back to that temple. Uh-oh. You show me in God's Word where it ever came back to that temple. It did not. God's presence was not there. Sacrifice was there. And it was that temple that Jesus walked into. And he said, I declare an end to this temple. They didn't hear it that way, but they said, we heard something that we never heard before. The man preached like nobody else preached. He had an authority, and when he said it, it sounded like thunder and lightning was taking place. And there was a change in the atmosphere. And you know what he did? He stopped the contentious temple. You want to say, oh, how is that a contentious temple? Turn with me to Nehemiah real quick, will you? Toward the end of the chapter of Nehemiah. You know where Nehemiah, it's around Ezra and Job and all that bunch. Come on. Let's get down to the last chapter of Nehemiah and let's see what a contentious temple, temple was. Chapter 13, Nehemiah. Look at verse 11. I realized that the portions from the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singer did not the work, was gone back to the field. So I contended with the rulers... Boy, it was a temple of contention from the word go. That which ended in a desecration and a captivity and was tried to be reestablished was a fruitless effort that ended with Jesus calling a halt to it. I contended with the rulers. Oh, that's not the only place. Look at verse 17. I contended with the nobles of Judah. You want to know what a temple looks like without the presence of God? Contention. I contended, verse 25, with them. And I got so involved in that contention, I said, this thing is coming back to God. Look what he did. He cursed them. I curse you that stand any longer in the same way you have stood before. I curse you. And then he slapped some of them. And he pulled on their hair. And he said, you're going to swear to God that you shall not give your daughters your wives. You're not going to take daughters for your sons and for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin with these things? Haven't we learned anything from that other temple? <laughs> Ninety-nine, forty-four, one hundred percent. You remember that old slogan? Some of you a long time ago. Of the churches today, we have to bear that judgment. In order to get in to speak the word of God, you'd have to contend with the nobles and the rulers and the people. 
because there's a people over here that want to be ministered to and they don't care who's ministering to them as long as they're there on Sunday morning they're paying them as long as they're doing what they're supposed to be doing as the world would say they, they have their job description they better fill it you're the preacher man so preach man uh huh. You, you have got to say something because it's 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 9 or whenever we ordered. It, it, it's the time and we're all assembled. And bless God, whether you say anything or not, we want to hear something. How do you know that God's through with that? Because when you feel it on the inside of you, you know God's through with that. Jesus came 400 years after that contentious body had their hair pulled and they didn't have any open word from God and there was no open vision and the prophet's mouths were shut and Jesus came on the scene and he walked into that Nehemiah Ezra type temple and he says, I tell you I got some news for you. Bam! Over went the table. Woo! Scribes and Pharisees, have I got a little word for you. Well, you want to know the word he had for them? Let's look at Matthew 23. Verse 35, there is a little word for them. Matthew 23, 35. Are you ready for this word? Here comes. Serpents, you brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you, what? wait a minute, read verse 35 with me. That on you, this day, this hour, from this moment, this is the end of that. This is the end of scribes and Pharisees and control and all kinds of misappropriation and what we have defined as church. This is the end of that and I'm going to hold you responsible for some things. And Jesus spoke to them some words they didn't want to hear. Here's it, here it is in verse 35. That on you may come all the righteous blood Shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel. We weren't there when Abel's blood was... Oh no, yeah, yeah, you were there. The same attitude that operated in your heart was in the heart of Cain. I'm holding you responsible for Abel's death. Oh, the Lord going to allow me to write a book on these days. It's going to be one I want to write. I've been writing one he wants to write. You know what? I'm going to write a book on Brother Russell sermons that you never hear on Sunday. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. And one of them is going to be verse 35. They took a big old survey one time and they asked the preachers, they said, why don't you preach harder? And he said, the majority of the preachers in that sociological survey from the University of North Carolina said, because our congregations won't put up with it. And so they asked the congregation, why don't, what do you want to hear? They said, we want to pre hear our preacher preach harder. <laughs> <laughs> that you may come, that on you may come, I put it on you, Churches of America, I put upon you every ignominy, every distance from God. I cause on every church in America and around the world, wherever the name of Jesus is, every church that's doing business as a church without the presence of the Holy Ghost of God, without the leadership of God, I place on you every ignominious act against God I bring in judgment. I call forth the iniquities every time we've met and not God has met with us. I call that upon this generation. I call on you the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. The generation he was talking to was not there when that act occurred. Now you can say what you want to, folks, but if you continue 
And this church is, and just you're just the focal point. This happened to be the temple that Jesus came in and said, this stuff applies to everybody and to everything that looks like this. If you keep doing business as usual, that curse will come upon you as well. Now he said, well now Jesus, you were unfair about that. No, no, Jesus wasn't unfair about that. The Holy Roman Catholic Church had inquisitions and shed the blood of millions. You think that the judgment is not coming on those congregations of this day for that sin. And don't you think that the day of the church, whether you feel like you're Pentecostal or whether you feel like you just sancto sancto, the day is over. Business is not going to be conducted any longer in the way it was conducted. Like it or not, there has to be some way I, I, I got to fussing with a doctoral, uh, a man on my doctoral committee, and I said, you know, Dr. St uh, Stenson, the work here is too hard. And he looked at me and he said, well, everything's got to be some way, and that's the way this is. You invited me. I'm sorry, Lord, it's come to this. I'm sorry, Lord, that you're having to hold the fact that there are three elements within the temple of heaven. And you showed it to Ezekiel. You said, you bring that temple down, the vision of the true temple down. And you say to them, how dare you put the door to salvation from your temple when the door of salvation is from this temple. How dare you assume that you have anything that looks like my thing? Oh God. Where are we? Where are we going in this? God said upon this group, I put all the burdens I bring to justice every awful thing that has been done in my name when I wasn't there I bring it to bear this is the way that is I get email all the time because of my book or books I had one that said who in the world can embrace this and I wrote back God's people The church stands at a crossroad. I had in my home Clayton Sonmore. Clayton had just come from Florida, the very seat of where an outpouring of the Spirit of God was. And from the very church where that outpouring has been for several years, and the very pastor who is now in a state of depression because of the decline. And I said, oh God, where is it going to be next? He said, it could be right here at Wow Center. But it won't be like it has been. They'll have to call on me. And call on me. And I will do a different thing here than I have ever done on the face of the earth before. I don't know what that does to you, but I'm glad to be a part of that. And I beg before God that you beg before God that he would do a different thing here. No matter the cost, the price, the pages, or whatever it is, that he would do his new thing here. Because you see, Jesus walked out of that tabernacle, that temple, and he started... <laughs> Pardon me, didn't mean to blast you like that. He started something called the church. But he didn't start it with a corporate body. He started it with a group of individuals in the upper room. And those 
individuals moved by the same spirit looked like a corporate body, but they were not. They were individuals standing and doing what they had to do in the spirit in such a way as to glorify God and every man, every woman standing in their position where God wanted them to stand looked like a corporate body, but it wasn't. We've made it look like a corporate body because we've lost fact of what was said in Acts 2. Will you turn with me there real quick? We're very close to the end of this. On the day of Pentecost, verse 3, there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. The fire came. Because the presence of God is like that. Came on the tabernacle, but it ended at Shiloh. Came on the temple, and it ended at the Babylonian era. It was tried to be restarted again, but it just shake, it shook and died. Just like the new one's going to shake and die. They're going to try to rebuild that thing, you know, and it's going to shake and die. Now I want to tell you something over here. Then came the church. And the church looks like today like a cockroach with orcans squirted all over him, laying on its back, wiggling and squiggling and trying to be alive. But God said, I have no interest. The glory has departed. Individuals sat in that upper room and Simon Peter saw that tongue. That tongue did not universally cover everybody in that room at the same time, I don't believe. I believe when it came and stood over John, John said, praise God, it's on me. <laughs> I believe Simon Peter said, oh, look at there, I got it. <laughs> but the rest of them were not doing that. They were saying, dear Lord, let it come on me. Let that spirit, let your spirit come on me. Let the fire touch me. Don't leave me out, Lord. Don't leave me out. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, you didn't leave me out. <laughs> I got it. Woo! Don't you know that's what drove them into the street like drunk men? Woo! I got it. I got it. I got it. I can't believe it. I got it. Read maybe Romans, the 11th chapter. You say, well, you sure covered it, brother. You started with Genesis and went right on through. Uh-huh. It's one book. One God. One Lord. One worship. Look at verse 19. Those people waiting down the hall, I feel so sorry for them. Bless their heart. We just prayed for them, though, didn't we? That little group just got together around that table and said, May the Spirit of God come upon them. So they're falling out on the floor right out here in the heaven. I just tell you, I want to see something from God. I just want to see something He's got for us. <laughs> I want you to know the glorified church ain't this one. And it's not the ones we've been looking at. <laughs> oh, look at it. Look at what he said in Romans 11. For if they're being cast away, verse 15, is the reconciling of the world, what will the acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Where holiness is, that's where he is. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted among them, and became partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast about the branches. For if you boast, you remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. My God is the center of this. And you will say, branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but to you goodness. And if you continue, if you will continue in his goodness, otherwise what? You also will be cut off.
Dare I say it? Yes, I must. Little cunning cookie cutter messages have had their day. They stand alongside the smoldering ruins of a temple that bore the judgment. Cute little platitudes proffered by pietous prelates on a piled up as a pier of flames today. This is the end of all that has been called. That branch grafted in is now going to see what it is to bear a judgment. The same kind of judgment that the Jews bore when they left God out and continued to worship and continued to sacrifice and continued as if God didn't matter whether He was there or not. The church who has continued its work whether God was there or not is over. Three things I can say about the church. Number one, it's a competitive body today in a competitive market. And you've got to look like everybody else or you're not in the fray. You're not going to have the crowds if you don't have the things that look like everybody else's thing. And you know what God said? Go ahead and do your thing. I'm going to meet with my people. I got some folks that have not bowed their knee and they're meeting with me and one of these days they're going to be manifested and when they are, they're going to look so different than what you are. You're going to say, I got the judgment. I got the judgment. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah, I got it. I didn't change. I didn't hear. I didn't join the reserves. I got the judgment. I, I looked at the program of a, of a congregation that's having a camp meeting. Elmer Towns was there saying how to build a huge church as if huge churches had anything to do with the Spirit of God. How to market your church today's media was on the program. And you know what I said? I dedicate this program to the flames and pitched it in the trash. Second Peter and Jude are not comic books. God said in the last days there would be a falling away. Because there's nothing in the house of God to draw anybody. But you let the presence of God come down in fire and holy smoke. And you watch the flame of God draw a crowd that you have never seen before. And you'll see earthquakes and miracles and blood and fire. And all the Word of my God will come to pass. And He will say, there is my glory. We're almost there. I can say that the church is now a ministry of the people and that the sons of Zadok are cloistered away waiting for their hour. It's a ministry only to the people. Because we've never seen, we've never seen, we've never seen. Only one time in my life have I ever seen <laughs> when the man of God turned away from the people and just glorified him and began to worship him. And to move in his spirit. And the crowd looked upon that person. And they said something's different here. It ain't like it used to be. Because he said only the sons of Zadok may minister unto me. And hold my holy things. But those other priests. The ones you've always had. They'll go on ministering to the people. But one day. You'll show the house to the house and they'll see the difference between what I had in mind and what they've been doing. You say, how do I do this? I don't know. Ask the Holy Ghost. This is His day. <laughs> Ask the Holy Ghost where you ought to be. <laughs> this is His day. <laughs> but I tell you what. God chose this church because you have possibility. Are you willing to be different? 
no matter what it cost to be his. You see, the church today, the third thing you can say about it is that the church has its own agenda. That's why all that bunch, you know, said, Lord, we've done all these mighty works in your name. He said, I don't know you. <laughs> they weren't my work. Well, I built a building, Lord. I hold 12,000 people. He said, well, that's wonderful. Welcome to the world of auditoriums. What do you want to hear? Someone with itching ears? Then don't call me. Don't call me. I won't have to do this. Don't call me. Because I'm going to tell you something. I know what it is to minister to Him. A prophet has been among them. <laughs> I bow before you, my Lord. The word is spoken. That bunch of people that came out of that which God put to, put to bear in Jesus' heart and bore in the upper room came out orchestrated by the Holy Ghost. And crowds of people cried out one phrase, What shall we do? <laughs> The temple should have been able to have told them what to do, but that kind of thing was over. Now we cry out, when can we leave? What program do we have next week? What's the spring schedule look like? What are we doing at summer camp? Who's going to be the next leader? What shall we build? And God said, Where am I in all of this? Weep, Ezekiel. Somebody's got to weep when they see what I look at. I hear sermons preached on Sunday I didn't give, so people who should have heard cannot hear. But that's what they want. So my servant preaches to a tree. Or a mountain. Or a wall. But his words will be heard. In the day of judgment they'll be heard. It'll be brought back. Because Jesus wasn't welcome there either. But every word he spoke came to pass. And that which comes from God will come to pass. Judge ye, O Lord my God, between the people and your servant. Bring forth the word. Cause it to be heard until there is a great shaking in this nation. And they understand, this is enough. What can we do? What shall we do? If you must go, go. Let those that are outside come in if they want to come in. Because there's still another portion to this. It's not long. We'll get through here. We don't need to sing. We don't need to take an offering. I probably wouldn't take it anyway. <laughs> 